Well, hey, gang. Good morning. How are you today? I mean, you look good. You did a good job today. Nice job. You know, sometimes getting ready doesn't go good, and you did a good job. I just want to tell you, good job. Turn the person next to you and say, you look good today. Nice. Now turn to the other person and say, I'm sorry you're my second choice, but you look good too. <laughs> hey, so here's the deal. Um, for those that don't know me, first off, my name is Jason Tucker. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm excited today that I get the opportunity to finish out this series that we started a few weeks ago called Sing It With Me If You Know. What's love got to do, got to do with it? Mm. <laughs> Put a little stanky leg on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so <laughs> there, there's no easy way to say this. Like Pastor Byron, um, I have to say this before we get started. Because he said, I'm going to tell him, uh, la- you know, the week before you get there that, that you begged me for this message. <clears throat> and, and the truth is, let's be honest, uh, we're talking about the four kinds of love in this message. We're talking about love and um, so there are three kinds of love that you've talked about up to this point, And I can assure you there were three teaching pastors in the room the day that we passed these out. And all of us chose a different one than the one that we're going to talk about today, because this is the one that's a little bit blushy, if you know what I'm talking about. And so I'm just here to tell you, I drew the short straw gang. That's what happened. All right. So, um, <laughs> no, today, uh, I'm excited. I really am. I, th- I think today's a message is, is timely, especially in the world that, look, that we live in today. And so in this series, what we've been looking at is just this idea, you know, are all kinds of love the same? Are, when, when we, we say things like we love our jeans, like you have your favorite pair of jeans, you're like, I love these jeans. These jeans are amazing. Uh, we, we love our pets. We love our spouse. Um, we love ice cream. Come on, somebody, you know? I mean, um, we love ice cream. And so, like, we love these things. We love to water ski. We love to sleep in on Saturday. But the question we've really been dialing into during the series is, are all those kinds of love the same? Are those all the same thing? Um, And really, probably even more of an important question that we've been asking, and I really want you to think about this today, because I think this is probably the most important question (laughs) that I could ask you today is, when's the last time that you felt loved? When's the last time that you, you, felt loved? Because honestly, it's, it's one of the most important things, I think it's one of the most important themes in all of Scripture that God wants you and me to know is that he loves you. Um, and he loves you more than you can imagine. You, you, you and I don't have a, fa- we can't fathom it. We, we can't filter that in our head um, because love is not something that God does. It's actually who God is. God is love. And so it's not like, I, like God, God can fall in and, out, in and out of love with me or you he is love. So the idea that God is love is, is really what we've been trying to unpack a little bit in this series because that's a big idea. That's a really big idea. And so um, we, I, I, we read this book a while back called The Four Loves. It was written by a guy named C.S. Lewis. He's kind of an important person and a big deal. But he basically said this. He said love is really when you think about love, it's kind of made up of all these things. There's a lot of ingredients to this thing called love. And so in week one, we talked about the one kind of love that's mentioned in the Bible is philia. And philia is like friendship love. And then uh, in another week, we talked about storge or storge love. And that's familiar love or like family kind of love. Um, We talked about agape love, which is like perfect love or unconditional love. That's what agape love is. Um, But the one that we haven't talked about yet here is this final one, and it's called Eros Love. And it's interesting because all of these kinds of love um, make up what God intended for love to be and for us to understand. And so it's a big idea. Um, I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and I've had many people ask me, like, Jason, tell me what the deep truths of, of the Bible are. 
Like, can you open up like Revelation and tell me about like what happens at the end of the world and all of these things? Can you go back to the creation story and tell me why God did this that way or this this way? Or can we talk about biblical prophecy and why this is this? I'm telling you in, in my time as a pastor, my humble opinion is this. You'll find nothing deeper in the Bible than love. It's the deepest ocean that any of us could ever swim in. <laughs> and, and, in fact, so much that this is getting, uh, getting this right, us understanding this, is us really understanding more about the character and nature of God. Because I want, I want you to hear this. It's, love isn't something God does. He, it's not an action. Literally, love is who God is. So when we get this right, we're experiencing God, literally, and in all these different ways, in our friendships, in our families, um, you know, again, unconditionally through his grace and mercy and love. But today, I want to talk to you about this other kind of love, which is called eros love. Now, uh, I also want to say this. This talk's a little blushy. So we're going to talk about some things that might be a little uncomfortable today. Um, but what better place to talk about them than church? Come on, somebody. Right? I mean, where should we talk about these things? They're in the Bible. They're in the Bible. So uh, we should probably talk about them in church. I know a lot of times it uh, can be an uncomfortable conversation, in particular with this conversation we're going to have today about Eros love. Here's a definition, a working definition today, just to give us something to think about. Eros love is the passionate, healthy physical expression of deep desire and sexual love between a husband and wife. Aren't you glad that you came to church today? <laughs> if you're thinking about leaving, just hang in there with me today, okay? Now, keep in mind, I want, I want to be 100% clear about this. In case you're wondering, you're like, are we coming to, are we, like, are we going to talk about sex in church today? I mean, it's part of the story, but I want you to hear me say this. This is about desire. Eros love, the foundation of this is about desire. It's about desiring another person in a way that God intended you to desire them. And for clarity's sake, it is about desire between a husband and a wife. I'm going to show you that in Scripture today. Now, if you're single and you're thinking, well, there's nothing for me in this message, that's not true. Because what you're going to see in this message uh, today is that there's a bunch in here for you. Um, if you're, you know, uh, again, for whatever reason, like this is a complicated subject for you. I talked to several people after the first service. They're like, it's just a complicated subject. I want you to know, I believe God's got something here for you today. So just give it time. Open your heart to the truth of God's word today, and let's see where God takes us. Um, okay, so let's lay a framework a little bit for this, because it is kind of like that talk, like, how do you get into this? I think you have to start with a solid foundation when you're going to talk about this idea. What does the Bible have to say about Eros love? Like, what did God intend for this kind of love? Well, the first thing I want you to know today is this. God made it perfect. We made it weird. So now it's complicated. In a nutshell, God made this perfect. It was his idea. And, and so that's what can be troubling about a topic like this sometimes when we think about it. When people say, why would you talk about that in church? Well, the answer is because God made it. The answer is because when you crack a Bible open, uh, you're going to see this kind of love. You're going to see the evidence of this kind of love in Scripture. It was God's idea. And we made it weird. We did. Our handling of God's idea is what made this weird. And now it's a complicated topic in our society today. And it continues to get more and more complicated. Come on, somebody. By the day. So let, let, me, let me just, I didn't write this. Let me just dial in and show you in Scripture what I mean by God made it perfect. We made it weird. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, all the way at the very beginning in Genesis 1.27, it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. God said, hey, man and woman, you were made for each other. And because you were made for each other, what I want you to see is there's blessing in you filling the earth. There's, you know, there, there's blessing in, in you seeing the importance of this kind of love between you. Fast forward to verse 31. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, he said, it was, say those next two words with me on the count of three. Help me preach this message today. One, two, three. It is very good. If you read the creation story, God creates this and calls it good. God creates that and calls it good. God creates that and calls it good. But then God gets to this part of the story and I take notice in the fact that he didn't just say this is good. He said this is awesome. This is awesome. He said this is very good. That's a step up from good. This, he's like, he's saying this is very good. Like I made this and I mean literally God is saying I'm impressed with how this turned out. This is incredible. Keep in mind, that, that's the framework we're working with. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Now the man and his wife, the man and his wife were both, let's get the blushing out of the way. Let's say this on the count of three with some gusto. One, two, three, naked. <laughs> he just cutting right to the chase. God creates male and female, calls it very, very good. So this is going to be awesome, you guys. I'm so excited for you in this. But then in that creation, in this story, he says, I want you to hear this. The man and the woman were walking around and they were both naked. They were naked. Is he going to say it again? He is. Naked. They were naked. Why is that important? Well, that's, that's important because of the context, but I want you to see this. They were naked and they felt no shame. They were naked and they felt no shame. There was no weirdness. Just think about that for a second. Think about the world we live in today. This is how God created it. Now, let me put a pin in that for a second and just be clear. I am not, your pastor is not advising you to go walk around naked after church. <laughs> Just make sure we get that out of the way. Okay. It's God created it to be perfect. We made it weird. It's complicated now. It is. It's complicated now. We live in a world where this is very complicated. So I'm not telling you to go walk around naked. What I am telling you, though, is when God created it originally, there, were, there was a man and there was a woman, and they were just walking around just doing their thing. And, like, there was no shame in it. They were just doing, hey, God, how's it going? Like, you know, and, and that was the relationship that they had with God. And what happened in this story, as you see it unfold, is the devil comes and starts to twist things like he's so good at doing. He takes this thing which God made to be perfect and he starts twisting it. And he starts luring Adam and Eve with this idea that maybe what God has to say about this really isn't actually what God intended to say. He's like, eh, I mean, did he really? Is that really what God meant? Is that really what God intended? And all of a sudden some doubt kind of landed in Adam and Eve's head. And then pretty soon they were like, you know, Maybe we should just try to do this our own way. And that's what happened. And so they chose to do things their own way uh, in opposition because I'm guessing they thought that they, there was something better than what God had to say. And watch what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Just one chapter later it says, at that moment, at that moment, when they decided not to handle this the way God intended, at that moment, their eyes were open and they, say that next word with me on the count of three, one, two, three, suddenly, just out of nowhere, they felt shame. It's complicated now. It's weird. I mean, we don't talk about this with God. 
like we don't bring this topic up or even think about those things in the presence of God. But again, that's not what we see in Scripture. What we see in Scripture is that God made this perfect. He had something perfect in mind. We made it weird. So now it's complicated. And so what happened is at that moment, their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. Now they were shameful. They're like, I don't know why I feel weird about this, but I do. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now things were hidden. Right? And ultimately, isn't that kind of what we've bought into is this idea like, you, you know, you keep those things, those dirty things hidden. Don't talk to people about that dirty stuff. That's, again, that's nowhere in this story do I see God respond that way. Adam and Eve are, are walking around and, and they're, they're feeling shameful. They're keeping away their distance from God because it's gotten weird. And so God calls out to them in the garden. He says, where are you? Hey, where'd you go? Like, why is this weird all of a sudden? Uh, and Adam and Eve, Adam replies, he said, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I heard you walking. I heard you coming, God. And, and, and I keep these things away from you. Because this is kind of a me thing, and that's kind of a you thing. And you, you really don't want anything to do with those things, God. Those are, those are bad things. I keep those bad things hidden from you. He says, I was afraid because I was naked. And God's response to Adam was, who told you you were naked? Why, why, did this, why is this weird all of a sudden? Obviously, God knew the answer to that question. But I believe he asked for Adam's benefit in that moment. And he said, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? That's a really important thing for us to remember today. This conversation that we're having today is about something that God created to make. And he made it perfect. And he called it very good. And he said, I've got an amazing plan for this kind of love that I want you to enjoy in your life in the right context. And if you'll do it my way, you'll experience something here that will absolutely blow your mind. Next thing, Eros love. It's a desire to be shared between a husband and a wife. Outside of that covenant, it'll mess things up. Again, that's just what the Bible says. The Bible says God created this kind of love between two people, a husband and a wife, who have decided to beloved each other. What does that mean? I choose you, you choose me, and in that choosing, in that covenant, we now have the kind of relationship where we can experience what God intended this to be. Outside of that covenant relationship, this will absolutely mess us up. It'll mess us up. It'll mess with our minds. It'll mess with our hearts. It'll mess with our emotions. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, remember God loves you. God is love. He wants good things for you. And in that he says, flee from sexual immorality. In other words, flee from handling this in the wrong way. It, it, it's not going to be good for you. If you don't handle this correctly, he said every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his or her own body. What's that mean? That means if I choose not to handle this the way that God says to handle it, I'm literally choosing to hurt myself. I'm just... That's what I'm choosing. I'm choosing to say, again, what, I don't have to agree with that for it to be true. In Scripture, I, I mean, what it's saying is if I don't handle this the way God says to handle it, I'm literally hurting myself. I'm, I'm inflicting pain on myself. James chapter 1 says this, 114, but each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed by his or her own, say that word with me on the count of three, one, two, three, desire. So the desire is in you. 
Newsflash. God put it there. It's not the naughty. It's the beautiful. He put it inside of you for a reason. He said, I want you to desire another person like this. I want you to have this desire inside of yourself. Now he said, hey, manage this desire with care. But I want you to have this kind of desire. It's a desire that should be shared between two people, husband and wife. But watch, he says, then the desire when it has conceived. What's that mean? It means when I haven't handled the desire correctly, it gives birth to things that are not of God. It, when I haven't handled the desire correctly, it gives birth to sin. It says when the desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. I just think that's an important thing for us to keep in our heads. The desire is not a sin. Single people, the fact that you desire another person, like there's a deep desire inside of you to want to give yourself fully to another person, God put that in you. That's, that's a desire that, that, that he wants you to have. That's a desire that he's wired you to have. Married couples, that's a desire he wants you two expressing to each other. That's absolutely uh, his plan and been his plan for this kind of love from the very beginning. And that's important that we see that. The desire is not wrong. The desire is created by God. How we handle the desire is where we can go awry. Next thing, it's not just physical intimacy, it's spiritual unity that God intended to never be torn apart. You know, when you, when you think about this topic, you think about this Eros love, a lot of times we just think, oh, we're getting the sex talk. Sex is just a, <laughs> sex is just a slice of the puzzle, gang. Um, and and if, if we think that sex is the full four-course meal, we're missing it. This is not just about sex. This is about something way, way bigger. It's not just about physical intimacy, it's about spiritual unity between two people. This was God's idea. This, is, this was how he made it, that two people would become spiritually unified as one person. Again, watch scripture, Mark chapter 10. But from the beginning of creation, from the very beginning, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but they're one flesh. Two people decide, husband, wife, we have a spiritual unity now about us in this relationship when we're expressing this kind of love to each other and this deep kind of desire for each other where I don't just think about myself anymore. I'm not just in it for me. You're not just in it for you. We become one. We're together on this. That was God's intention from the very beginning. And then that last line, what, what therefore God has joined together, let no one tear apart. God's purpose on this was that we would be joined together, two people, husband and wife, spiritually unified, not just physically intimate. Okay, last thing, framework. Uh, maybe you've heard all of this and you're like, okay, uh, this message is awesome because I'm thinking about um, all the times that I didn't handle this right. And I want you to hear me say this just so we're all on the same page. Welcome to the club because I haven't handled it right either. I, I'd love to sit here and tell you from a place of strength, man, I've knocked this out of the park every time. Every time, you know, knocked it out of the park. That's just not true. Um, I've swung and missed it this many times in my life and uh, I've been married to my wife now for 27 years. I can tell you that uh, in, in our marriage now, uh, there are a lot of things I know now that I didn't used to know. There are a lot of things I'm learning today that I didn't know yesterday. This is an ongoing thing about how to learn and experience what God really wanted for our lives. It's, it's a lifelong journey that we go on together. And so with that being said, I just want to say this, and I, 
I hope you hear this today more than anything else that I would say. No matter how you've handled it up to this point, it's never too late to handle this the way God intended. God's desire for all of us is, that, is not that we would, well, I've handled it wrong, and I guess I could never imagine that God would want anything good for me in this. Well, I've, uh, I've not handled this correctly, and uh, boy, I've, I've, just, I've, I've gone too far and done too much that there could ever be anything good for me um, considering. That's just not God's heart. I, I want you to hear me say that today because that's really important. I mean, and th that goes for, you know, people stuck in pornography today. Like, again, I don't know why I look at this stuff, but here I am looking at this stuff. And I didn't intend to look at this stuff, but here I am looking at this stuff. Like, if that's you today, I just want you to know God sees exactly where you are. And he loves you. And his heart towards you is good. Again, shame is the devil's game. Right? We just read that in the story. Shame is the devil's game. That you would hide that away from God and think that God doesn't see that or doesn't care about that or... You know, God doesn't understand the desires that you have. I want you to know it's just not true. It's just a lie. God understands the desires you have. He gave them to you. And in his giving them to you, his, uh, his desire is that we would just make the decision that we want to go after his best. And so we want to try to handle things the way that he says. And so with that being said, no matter how I've handled this kind of love up to this point, good, bad, or otherwise, it's never too late for me to decide. Today, I want to start handling this God's way. I want to start seeing this God's way. Romans chapter 6 says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. What does that mean to us? That means... Literally, God is saying, this might be just, again, if, if you're in a spot where you're like, no, I haven't handled this God's way, and you feel like all is lost, that's what death looks like. But again, what we're being encouraged here by the, the writer of Romans, Paul, he's saying, present yourself to God in a way as to be someone who is like, God, I know I haven't handled this right, and I know you're going to make something good out of it. That's what you do, God. That's, that's what makes you God. He says, like, those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law. You're under grace. You're under grace. That means when God looks at you and he looks at me right now in our current dealings with this in our life, he sees a beautiful masterpiece that could come to be if we'll just start trusting him with what he says, if we'll just start believing that he really wants something good for our lives. Because frankly, this is pretty natural that we would do this. Uh, we we kind of build this upside down. We start with the, the intimacy. Go ahead and put that pyramid up. We start with the intimacy and we make that the foundation of, of our relationships. We start with that. We start with the, the, the things which are intimate and Again, um, this desire, a mismanagement of the desire. And then all of a sudden that starts creating some emotions. And then after those emotions are created and we re really feel like, Ugh, I feel kind of, this is interesting now. How do I navigate this? Then that's usually the part where we're like, well, we probably better invite God into this. Because it's, it's gotten a little weird or it's, it's it, you know, one person is all focused on themselves and the other person's all focused on themselves. And we're like, we kind of need God in the middle of this. Where, again, God's intention was us to build it this way. That we would start with God. That we would start with saying, I trust what God says. Um, it might not be easy, but it's worth it. I trust what God says. is That's what we're going to build this on. I'm going to find someone to build this with. And, and it's going to be, we trust what God says about this. And in that, as we're trusting what God says about it, some emotions start to come and, and happen in, in our lives where we start building this together. And then as an expression of desire for this other person, that's where this Eros love and this desire is expressed. 
This is God's intention. So with the time I have left, I just want to answer this question because I want you to practically be able to walk out of here today. No matter where you are, I want you to be able to walk out of here today and know this. What does healthy Eros love look like? What is healthy? When this is healthy, when we're, when we're handling this the way God says we should handle it, what does that look like? I'm going to give you a few thoughts. First, it's exclusive. It's exclusive. What's, what does that mean, Jason? That means this. I exclusively choose God's way. I can't have Eros love any other way. I'll never get to experience the fullness of what God designed this beautiful, very good love to be if I don't exclusively say, God, I'm going to handle it the way you say. If I choose to handle it my way, I can't have it. It's exclusive. It's God's way. Another way it's exclusive, it's one person. It's one person. If I'm a man, it's me choosing my wife. If I'm a woman, it's me choosing my husband. This is the only way I can have it. I have to choose one. Now, again, remember, no matter how you've handled it up until now, it's never too late to handle it God's way. That's important, really important. But I have to choose one as my beloved. I have to say, that's the one. My wife was in here the first service. Notice she's not in here the second service. What does that tell you? I'll help you with that. It tells you Jason's in trouble when he gets to the car after church. Because I had her stand up last service. I said, hey, stand up. And she loves it when I do that. And I said, 27 years. Uh, and I pointed out, I choose her. I choose her. She, she's the one. I choose her. Uh, she chose me. We, we chose each other. Again, spiritually exclusive. Like, I, that's, I promised her. I, I, my eyes are for none other than her. And I'm saying that publicly because, again, I want you to hold me to that. Like, we should hold each other to that. I said, she's my one and only. She's my beloved. And because I love her, and, and again, I'm, I'm not telling you in 27 years that I didn't have my ups and downs with that. There were times I gave my heart to a lot of things. I'm learning more and more and more how to, how to walk that out. And it's not just people that you give your love to. It's other things that you give your love to. But I'm learning more and more 27 years into a marriage how that she is my beloved. I love her. She's like the apple of my eye. And, and I, I want, my desire is for her. And, I, and, and that desire continues to grow in me because I, I know that she has that same desire for me. We've chosen each other. That's why the great theologian Johnny Cash got it right, you know, when he said, because you're mine, I walk the line. You know what I mean? That's it. I chose her. She chose me. Like, if you dig into the Bible, um, you're going to find out. Song of Solomon uh, is this beautiful dialogue between um, a single woman and man. And then eventually those, that single woman and that single man get married. And Song of Solomon, it's King Solomon and his, and his, you know, his wife here. And, and this dialogue he's having um, with her is kind of a back and forth dialogue. But these were her words. She said this, promise me, she's talking to the women around her. She said, promise me, O woman of, women of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and wild deer, not to awaken love until the time is right. Don't awaken this until the time's right. Don't think you can handle this uh, until the time is right because it is a deep desire. It's something inside of you God put there, but also if you don't handle it God's way, it can, it can cause some trouble in your life. So she's saying, be careful about awakening this desire. Be careful. Be, be very thoughtful in that. Why? Why is she saying that? Because this idea of, Eros love is holy. It's holy. It's God created it to be holy. Lovemaking is holy. It's a gift. It's reserved for the intimacy of a covenant relationship where two people decide to become one. It's holy because it's righteous. It's pure. It's not nasty. It's not dirty. God said it's beautiful. It was his idea. And so it's holy. 
And that's why he said there shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality. Like, don't even, don't put your fingerprint on this. It's that beautiful. Like, it's so beautiful and precious to God. Ephesians 5, chapter 3 says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed. Notice that. Greed is like, it's all about me, my needs. No, don't let there be a hint of that because that's improper for God's, say that next word with me on the count of three, one, two, three, holy people. This is holy. God sees this as holy. C.S. Lewis said this in his book, The Four Loves. He said, the real danger seems to me not that two lovers will idolize each other, but that they will idolize the desire itself. He, what he's getting at here is that what we have to understand about this kind of love for each other is that there's a real danger to just love the sex more than you love the person. That's a danger. Because again, if, if you just love the sex more than you love the person, it's headed for the ditch, gang. It's headed for the ditch. It's, if you just love the intimacy more than you love the person, that was never God's intention. Like, there's really, no, like, that's not how he made this. I have to desire this person. That's, that's how God intended this to be. It's exclusive. Next thing, it's expressive. It's expressive. Eros love is expressive. It's a symphony. It's happening all the time. It's not like, hey, I'll see you later tonight around 9 o'clock. No, Eros love is expressive. It's like a symphony. It's happening all the time. It's, 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 it's constantly in motion, expressing that someone is your beloved. It's verbal. It's vocal. It's everywhere and all the time. Everywhere and all the time. It's not just in the bedroom later that night. Nope, you know what it is? It's, it's with that morning coffee. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. You put that little in your morning coffee. Right? And you walk out and just say, babe, you look so good to me today. You are so beautiful. You are the apple of my eye. You, I, mean, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about you. When you're at work, you're like, man, I'm busy, but I'm telling you, I'm here working. I'm so busy. But like you're sending texts, like I'm busy, and all, but all I'm thinking about you. It's, it's expressing itself all the time. It's that morning call. It's that little, excuse me for saying, it's that little pat on the bottom. Come on. In the morning. Right? Ooh. It's expressing itself. I had someone tell me after service, I don't like to be patted on the bottom. I'm like, listen, I'll get it. I get it. That's all good. Listen, we'll get to that in a second. But no, it's expressing itself. It, there's an expression of it. I, I've been, my, my wife and I have been doing marriage counseling uh, with couples for 20 years. And I know it's uh, an invasive question to ask, but it's one of the first questions I ask. How's it going? Is, it, are you, is that, is that ex being expressed between you? Is there deep desire being expressed between you? Because if there's not deep desire being expressed, the truth is there might be some things that we need to work on. There might be some things that we need to think about. Because, again, that's, this is God's desire is that we would desire another person so much that we would express our love to them. Vocally, verbally, like a symphony all the time. Here it is in Scripture, Proverbs 5. This is the husband, Solomon. He said, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. <laughs> we don't talk about that stuff in church. Why? It's in the Bible. It's, in, it's literally in Scripture. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Ladies, here's, here's the woman expressing herself to her man. 
Oh, that he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is intoxicating. Your name is perfume poured out. I'm like, the, the dude was wearing perfume? Like, like Old Spice or what? What are we? I don't know. Uh, no wonder young women adore you. Take me with you. Let us hurry. Oh, that the king would bring me to his chambers. I got news for you, gang. They ain't going to Applebee's. <laughs> they ain't going to Applebee's. There's expression happening there. I desire you. I love you. Oh, my word. I, like, I have this deep desire in me for you. You are my beloved. Again, like I said, it, it's just something we got to be careful with because, again, expressing ourselves like we love the person. We love the person, not just the act of expression. That's why the Bible is very clear in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says this, do not deprive each other of this desire. Married couples. This is strictly for married couples. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer. It's like, hey, listen, if you're going to choose to not express these desires towards each other, you really need to make sure there's a mutual agreement here between the two of you. And, and, and really the only time you should do it is if your plan is to pray. It's, it doesn't say to not express yourself towards each other when you're mad at each other. I'll move on. <clears throat> um, it says only for, perhaps for the, to devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, like, hey, th you have a person that you're beloved to in this way. And because you're expressing yourself to each other this way, if you stop doing this, it's going to actually push them to desire other things and other people. And that's dangerous. That's something that we should definitely consider. What does healthy Eros love look like? It's exclusive. It's expressive. Last thing I'm going to leave you with today. It's considerate and generous. It's considerate and generous. What does this love look like? It's exclusive. My wife, I choose you. Me. She says, I choose you. It's exclusive. It's expressive. I, I should, this desire for this woman that God has given me, my desire is that, that she would know how much I love her, how much that she means to me. How much, like, I want good things for her. And the fact that we're not two anymore, we're one. And so I don't think like a, a, an opposing, we're, we're not opposing forces. We're unified. God brought us together. That's what it is. But now at the, at the, at the end of the story, it's considerate and it's generous. What does that mean, Jason, that Eros love is considerate and generous? It means this. It's focused on the other person. Healthy Eros love is focused on the other person. It's not focused on me. I, I'm not being considerate when I'm demanding something. I'm not being considerate when I'm not being generous myself because I'm focused on me. Healthy Eros love is focused on the object of your love. You're, you're, you're being considerate and generous to the object. If it's focused on the self, if it's focused on what I need, my needs, getting something, I'm not getting, I'm not getting, I'm not getting. It's, that's not healthy. Healthy Eros love says this. Babe, what do you need? What do you need? That's what it, I, I want to consider your needs, not, not just mine. I want to know what you need. And I, I want you to help me understand more about what you need. And I want to be generous in terms of how I express myself and give myself to those needs. That's 
what healthy eros love looks like. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 5, 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. If you could circle anything in your Bible <laughs> about this topic, it's right here. This is a profound mystery. It's a profound mystery. This idea that one person in this Eros love could, I'm not just thinking, I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about the object of my affection. I'm thinking about the desire I have for this other person. And I'm considering their needs. I'm being generous towards their needs. Why? That's a mystery. Who does that? Who does that? That's why Paul said, this is a mystery. This is a mystery. Most people won't do this. It's a mystery why anyone would do that. But he said, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. This is what's so bizarre at this. Like, again, God made this perfect. So what Paul's saying is this. He's saying this expression of two people becoming one, this expression of Eros love is literally the expression of Christ and the church. He said, if you want to know what it should look like, if you want to know how it should be, look at how Jesus responded to the church. And you're like, how can you combine? How can you talk about Jesus and church when you're talking about this? And the answer is because God made it perfect. We made it weird. And so now it's complicated. But it's very simple in the eyes of God that we would be considerate and generous towards the needs of the other person. And that's where the trust and the mutual respect come in. We, we have a trust and a mutual respect and we're considerate and we're generous towards each other. Why? Because Jesus didn't come demanding anything. In fact, Jesus didn't come say, what do, what do I get out of this? No, he came and he saw us where we were and he loved us where we were. So what did he do? He said, I, I love them so much. I need them to see how much I love them. Th they're not seeing. I don't, I don't have anything in this for me. I just, I want, to I want to show them my desire for them. So what did he do? He let it, them drag him out into a public square and beat him with a whip for you, for me. He said, I, I, I want to make sure that they know how much I love them. He, 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 let, he let them take him out to the public square and, and, and he expressed that love and the fact that he took stripes on his back for our healing. He knew we had no chance no, of saving ourselves, of rescuing ourselves. So what did he do? He, then he let him drag him up a hill and nail him to a cross. Put nails in his hands and feet. Why? Why? Why would somebody do that? Because he's considerate. And he's generous. And the answer to why he would do that is because he loves you. With a love that is so much bigger than you could ever imagine. And he wants us to learn more, to take part more in what this love is all about. But the choice that we have before us today is just simply this. No matter how we've handled it up until this point, good, bad, or otherwise, no matter how we've handled it up until this point, it's never too late to start handling this the way God intended. Will you pray with me today?